Ladies and gentlemen, let me try to very quickly take you through some of the core points in the strategy debate we're having, and then leave as much time for questions and your concerns as possible. So if you were worried about a long PowerPoint presentation, I'm not going to give you one. But I think there are some graphics which unfortunately do get lost, or people have not seen. And let me skip ahead, if I may, to what they are. One is the sheer scale of what's happening in Afghanistan. You hear a lot about troop levels, but they're often taken out of the context. This is a country roughly a third bigger than Iraq. Its population is much larger. We don't know how much larger, but it is very significantly larger. The reason we don't know is we haven't been able to map just how many young Afghans there really are and get an accurate estimate of the birth rate. It is far, far poorer than Iraq. It has one of the least developed structures of governance in the world. It is extraordinarily difficult to move in because of its geography. It is segmented not only ethnic and sectarian terms, but by geography. And the weather problems are greater. So when we talk about a war, and we are talking about a war, the commitments you make have to be proportionate to the size of the enemy and the size of the country and its resources. And this is a point which sometimes is easily lost. Now, one of the things I find surprising about how people have looked at this is first, understand what we're talking about. This is not a US-dominated alliance. If you look at the maps, we moved into Helmand with the British recently. We've expanded our role with Canada, but it is a 42-country alliance. Some countries are stand-aside countries bound by national caveats. There is a real problem in coordination and efficiency, as there is with the international aid effort, much of which is wasted or irrelevant to Afghan needs. But also, there are a number of countries which are absolutely critical. And this is one of the things that is often lost in the discussion of the McChrystal Report. It is a report done by NATO ISAF, not by the United States. The report was sent forward to the Secretary General at the same time it was sent forward to the President. It was sent forward to NATO commanders when it was sent forward to U.S. officers. There is another side of this which is often ignored, which is the report by Ambassador Eikenberry, which focuses on the civil side and the aid side. And that has been as important a component of the U.S. relook at strategy as the military side. What I think, though, if I may skip ahead, is really critical, is to understand that we've had years of warning of the need for change. If you look at this map, it's 2005. In 2002, there was virtually no insurgent or Taliban presence. The details of this are on the web, but the key point is the yellow and dark orange area are where the Taliban were in 2005. The next map is 2007, and the red map is the area of intense Taliban threat or presence. We have had years of warning more than half a decade of warning of the situation that General McChrystal worried about and what she described as a crisis, and we have watched it build steadily. Without proper reaction, without proper resourcing, without proper focus on the Afghan National Security Force or the needs of the Afghan people. And a great deal of the growth of the insurgency you see here is not out of any great success or ideological conviction or military victory. It's because it moved into a power vacuum where there was no meaningful military or Afghan government presence and where there was no effective supply of aid or the other structures that could have won the loyalty of the Afghan people. Now, when you talk about strategies, let me just point out, we are shifting from a focus on tactical encounters, what sometimes is called a kinetic strategy, to a focus on the Afghan population. 
Those red clusters which move into Pakistan are a little hard for anybody sitting in the back to understand, but what's the key point? Kinetic activity is centered around not necessarily within population centers. This is a battle not to defeat NATO in the field. It is a battle to control the population, establish shadow governments, take control over the informal justice system. It is also a battle, however, through bombings, through attacks, to create a structure which will drive NATO, ISAF, out of the country, remove political and popular support, create large-scale incidents or bombings, real or imagined, or propaganda, in ways which will be disruptive enough to give the Taliban a political victory. Now let me just note that as you look at this map, it doesn't have those neat, large, colored blobs of occupation. There are maps which would show you that now the Taliban, with almost zero influence in 2002, has some kind of presence in 80 percent of the country. That's almost certainly exaggerated. But no one would deny that it's a presence in over 40 percent of the country. That doesn't mean control. It doesn't mean it dominates the area in all of the places it's present. But it does give you a scale of what is happening and the need to change operations. And what are the tools for doing this? Well, I won't walk you through a complex PowerPoint presentation. Again, it is on the web. But what we have postulated is a change in tactics. Now, some of you have read press accounts saying that these tactics vary in options from basically withdrawal and to focus on counterterrorism centered on al-Qaeda to troop levels of 40,000 men. Both are inaccurate. The vice president, the debate within Washington is essentially, can you deal with the level of reinforcements the president called for in March, staying in Afghanistan and when, through an increased focus on attacking the core of the insurgency in Afghanistan and Pakistan? Or do you need to go to a broader strategy which deals with much more presence in populated areas and which is a much more pervasive civil military strategy, which we call shape, clear, hold, and build? They're not directly different, but let me give you the broader elements. The increase in troops, which would largely be U.S., would not simply be for war fighting. It would be because we can't provide enough civilian aid workers in the field in high threat areas to be effective. Today, many, if not most, of the PRTs are already military. This is a reality and it will not change. Recruiting and getting effective aid workers in the numbers required is distinguished from people who are often very effective and stay in multiple tours simply is not going to happen. People have tried. You are talking about using other people to basically create much larger Afghan forces. And these are not simply military, although you would seek to double the Afghan military, which sounds very ambitious until you consider the size of the country and the population. It is you need an effective Afghan police force with paramilitary capabilities to survive. You need that if it is to protect any kind of forward government presence and to create any kind of rule of law structure. It is the key to being able to gradually phase out what is a military partnership and aid to one where civilian aid workers can operate safely in a majority of the country, and they cannot today. 